All right, so we're going to get started. So uh, last but not least for the day is uh, Chris Lautenberger. You may have heard Chris' name. He's been mentioned uh, a number of times uh, for suit modeling, pyrolysis modeling, the development of G-Pyro. You would imagine that this is somebody who is all uh, and has made a lot of contribution uh, working in academia. That's not the case. He's done that all. <laughs> And he's not in academia, and he's a, a consulting engineer uh, working for React Engineering. And uh, with this, the floor is yours. Yeah, th thank you. So basically, jack of all trades, master of none kind of thing. Um, so I'm going to talk about some work that we've been doing recently in California under funding from the California Energy Commission primarily, um, and secondarily under funding from... Uh, NIST, a few other organizations, Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, NASA, um, and a couple others, some utilities. And um, the kind of overarching project we've dubbed Pyrogence, which is short or sort of a moniker for fire intelligence. And it was, it was basically we got sick of just calling it the CEC project. So um, the California Energy Commission decided about five years ago that they want to get in the business of funding the development of open source fire modeling and, and risk tools. Um, and so we put together a, a consortium of 18 organizations that went in on this uh, proposal, and we were uh, fortunate enough to be selected. And uh, this, this consortium or, or this project really has four main working groups, and they're all sort of loosely related. So Working group one is led by Janice Cohn. Uh, she is well known for doing coupled atmosphere fire modeling. Her model is called Coffee. But on this project, she is actually looking at extreme weather archetypes and also helping develop um, essentially a, a, maxim, a max end, a maximum entropy tool for citing weather stations, identifying you know, blank spots or, or blind spots where there might not be good information. And um, help, helping the utilities you know, figure out where to best deploy their stations. The uh, second working group is led by Scott Stevens at UC Berkeley, and that's all about basic fire behavior. And one of the things that they're really diving into is how does post frontal combustion, so uh, you know, burning, of course, woody debris after the fire front passes, how does that influence the, the overall fire behavior by creating a convective column? And I don't think Mark mentioned this in his talk this morning, but Mark, um, as part of that project, he, he's a, a collaborator, has uh, out at the Missoula Fire Lab built a gigantic grain bin um, that they're going to do some really cool uh, smoldering and, I guess, flaming combustion experiments for, like, really large diameter wood. Um, I'm leading work group three, which is all about forecasting, short-term forecasting in particular. So that means out to about a week. Uh, maybe a little bit more than that in some cases. And uh, just wanted to mention the fourth uh, working group, which is looking at fire on the landscape much later in the century. So 2050 to 2100, how does climate change affect where fires are mo more likely to occur? Um, and they're doing some really cool statistical modeling. Um, it's, it's quite different tools and techniques than what I'm going to talk about today. And... Um, my laptop doesn't project very well. It makes things too dark, so I'm going to switch over to the room PC. And I'm first going to do a, a kind of an intro and demo of the forecast tool that we're, we're developing, and then I'll, I'll go into some of what's under the hood. So uh, we had a strategic decision to make back when this project was first funded. Um, there were kind of two routes to go. One was to work on the fundamental fire spread models that are, are used in, you know, operationally. And uh, the second was to work on the framework that can be used to um, take those models and provide information to end users. And we actually chose the second route. Um, felt like Mark and others had a, a really good uh, head start on developing the, you know, the improved fundamental models. And so really... Um, although we're saying this is open source, next generation fire spread models, it's really an open source, next generation fire spread modeling framework, really. And I'll, I'll show you what, what, I, what I mean by that. So um, we made the decision to build a browser-based interface rather than having like a Windows application that you install, you know, a big monolithic thing. So this is all stuff you can run from a browser. You can, you know, it's mobile, mobile aware, so it works on your phone. And... 
um, it's connected by all these microservices that talk to each other and do you know little tiny programs that do one little aspect of fire modeling, and they all collectively work together to um, help us understand fire spread and 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 risk. So the uh, URL is pyrocast.org. If you go there, uh, actually, let me pretend like I just loaded it. You'll get a disclaimer. The lawyers made us put this on there, and what this disclaimer says is this is an experimental tool. Uh, it has a lot of limitations. Use at your own risk, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, there's also a, a terms of use and privacy policy. So once you um, get the legal stuff out of the way and click accept, um, what you'll see is a map, and it should be you know super intuitive to use because everybody uses Google Maps and Google Earth these days. So I'll just walk through some of the navigation things before I get into some of the fire-specific stuff. So uh, down in the bottom left, you can select different base maps. So switch over to satellite. The one that I like to use is Satellite Street because it's got some place names and, and you know state borders and things like that. Um, I should have pointed out at the beginning, this is uh, US-centric, specifically the continental US. So we don't even have Alaska or Hawaii in here yet. There's some plans to expand to Alaska and possibly to Hawaii. Um, but no Canada. Unfortunately, I wish we could be modeling those fires up there right now. Uh, they use a different fuel system, and our models don't work in Canada. Um, same for, for Mexico. We don't have uh, fuel data in, in Mexico. So um, U.S.-centric, continental U.S.-centric. Um, there's some um, kind of real-time situational awareness things that can be <laughs> brought in. So this is the uh, Real-time RGB GOES-16 image, so uh, GOES-16, also called GOES-East, is a geostationary satellite that's sitting up there taking, uh, taking shots of the U.S. every five minutes. Yesterday, you could really see the smoke over in this area. Now, because there's some cloud cover, it's not quite as obvious. Um, and then this will update, you know, sort of, sort of continuously on a, a, about a, every, every five-minute kind of loop. Um, there are... In addition to GOES, there are some orbiting satellites that provide hotspot data. You know, basically, where do the satellites sense heat? There are four satellites. Uh, two have a sensor called MODIS. Two have a sensor called VIRS. And these have a revisit time of about every 12 hours. So each of these four satellites is overhead every 12 hours. So we're imaging the, you know, the fire, really, the, the whole continental U.S. several, several times per day. And... Um, just for fun, why don't we look at some of those fires up in Canada? So this is this is where all the smoke is coming from, and I'm not sure how far north this goes. I don't know if, if there's actually fires burning north of here that we're just not seeing because we don't have the satellite data, or if or if this is it. But um, I'll show some of the smoke modeling later, and you'll you'll see where the smoke is really coming down pretty heavy from uh, from those fires. And then there's there's a little bit up in British Columbia as well, but nothing uh, like in, in eastern Canada. Um, and I'll, I'll show how we use the satellite data to build fire perimeters and use those to initialize fire spread models here shortly. Uh, so that's the uh, satellite hotspot data from the orbiting satellites. And then uh, there is publicly available uh, fire perimeter information from the National Interagency Fire Center. And uh, what we do is basically accumulate fire perimeters all year long and then wipe it January 1. So these are fires that have burned since January 1. There were some, uh, some fires in Oklahoma back around, I think, end of, end of March kind of time frame. That's typically o Oklahoma. You know, Texas fire season is usually kind of March and April. Um, these perimeters can come from different sources. Sometimes they're hand sketches. More often, they're infrared overflight. So um, can be fixed. You know, you, typically a fixed wing aircraft will, will image the fire in the in the evening uh, when conditions permit. And then these update. It, it kind of depends, but um, we're usually getting a fire imaged uh, once it's a big fire about every day, sometimes twice a day. Um, part of what we're we're doing is looking at. Uh, potential impacts to assets at risk. The uh, probably the most important is structures. So you can uh, display the structure data from the Microsoft Bing building footprint data set. It's for the continental U.S. Um, so lots and lots of data. But you can kind of zoom in, and I'll, I'll switch over. Just I, I don't I didn't pick this area in particular for any reason, but um, you can see 
how they you know have identified all these uh, all these structures here, and we actually use this data for quantifying impacts, basically counting up all the structures that are inside a you know a modeled fire perimeter, use that as an impact metric. And remember, this is funded by the California Energy Commission, so we have uh, transmission line data, and that's used for for two things. One is uh, it's, it's also an asset, right? You don't want fires burning under 500 kV transmission lines. That creates all kinds of problems because they have to be de-energized. Um, that, w there was a, a fire called the Bootleg Fire two years ago, burning in Oregon, uh, right in the middle of a heat wave. And it was looking like California was going to go into rolling blackouts because the fire was about to impact the 500 kV line and there wouldn't be enough energy to meet the, the, the demand. Luckily, that didn't happen. Um, the other thing we use these for is uh, lighting fires under power lines. Um, there's a, a, a movement toward reducing fire risk from utilities by de-energizing power lines under certain conditions. Basically, when things are really, really windy, it's a, really a last resort. But if you look at the uh, recent large loss fires, uh, power line fires are disproportionately represented in, in large loss fires, like 2%-ish of fires are caused by power lines, but 60 to 80 percent of, of large loss fires are caused by power lines. So um, it's really a, a dramatic uh, increase in um, you know high high risk fires under these really high high wind conditions. So I'll show some of the things um, that are are being done to get a handle on and understand potential impacts. Yeah, do you have a question? Just for, because. When you say high loss, do you mean high loss in terms of acreage or in terms of building capacity? Uh, buildings, yeah. Uh, but also, the power line fires tend to get big as, as well. The, we talked about the Dixie fire yesterday. That was a power line fire that didn't ignite under high winds, but it got to a million, million acres. Um, but th there are examples where power line fires igniting under high winds get to 100,000 acres plus in a day or two. So um, they're high impact from... Uh, you know, a structure loss standpoint, but also uh, timber loss and, and burned area as, as well. So um, let's see. Over here on the right, we have a couple interesting things. Uh, fire history. So this is fire history for the last 20 years. I don't think we've updated this for, for 2022 yet. But um, speaking of the Dixie fire, let's go to, well, let's start with the Caldor fire. This was a a big fire in California that burned in 2021. It was the first time that a fire had crossed the Sierra Crest, either the first or second. Um, the second or the first, I can't remember, was the Dixie Fire. So they started over here on the, uh, you know, basically the west side of the, C of the Sierra Crest, burned under um, strong southwest winds over a period of several weeks. And everybody was really super concerned that uh, it was going to make it to South Lake Tahoe. So this is a really, really nice, beautiful area here, uh, right by Lake Tahoe. And um, there was a lot of chatter. Oh, could the fire possibly make it to South Lake Tahoe? Everybody, I would say, was leaning toward no. There were very few people who thought it could. Well, it did. It made it to South Lake Tahoe. Uh, first fire or second to cross the Sierra Crest uh, back in 2021. And then the, uh, the Dixie Fire, which is this monster up here, did the same thing at about the same time. So um, that should tell us a little bit about climate change and recorded history that had never happened, and it happened twice in, in the same year. Um, okay, so fire history is useful because we can look at, you know, basically get an idea of where uh, fuels might be reduced due to recent fire activity, um, and conversely, where the, you know, areas that haven't burned in, in quite some time. Uh, so let me turn off the fire history layer, and then... Um, red flag warnings. So if you're not familiar with um, red flag warning, which I wasn't until I moved to California, this is a, uh, a mechanism for the National Weather Service to get a warning out that there's some combination of usually dryness and wind uh, or dry lightning that creates elevated fire risk conditions. And so right now it looks like there's a red flag warning going on in, uh, in Michigan. So if you click on that, it'll, you know, Pop over to the NWS page and you know kind of tell you what's uh, what the what the concern is. Actually, let me make this full screen. It'll be a little bit easier to see there. Um, so red flag warning, and then this is this is one of my favorite parts of this tool here. 
is the, uh, the real-time camera feed. So there are cameras deployed all over the western U.S. There's currently two networks. One is called Alert Wildfire, and the other is called Alert California. They used to be the same. There was a bit of family feud. They split up. Um, and so what you can do is pick a, a camera of interest. I, I mentioned Lake Tahoe, so let's, let's see what's going on over there. Looks like it's a nice day, a little thunderstorm. There's been thunderstorms up there every day uh, for the last couple weeks. You can see there's still snow up in the, up in the mountains. Um, and so there, there's other cameras around. So this is useful. You know, we're, we're kind of doing some picnic planning here, but really what you want to use this for is when there's a, you know, a fire burning, uh, looking at the fire activity, monitoring it in real time, you can go to the Alert Wildfire site where we actually pull this data from by an API and um, look at time lapse and you know go back a day, things like that. It's it's really a, a pretty cool, uh, pretty cool tool. And one of the things it's really useful for during fires is comparing our spread models to what's happening out there. So this. Uh, Terrain, you can make it 3D by clicking this little mountain here. It'll go 3D. You can also um, click this zoom to camera angle, and it will basically zoom in to the same angle that the camera has. And so that is sort of, you know, here's Lake Tahoe. You can see this little peninsula here. That's this, that's this over here. So you can orient the view in the, the model, in the application, to... Uh, the same view as the as the camera, so that was a, some nice functionality that um, that got built in here within the last couple of years. Um, so that's really it for for navigation, um, except you'll note there's four tabs at the top: fuels, weather, risk, and active fire. So I'll just go through those in in order from left to right, and let me zoom back out, get overhead again. Um, we heard. We heard Mark and Jason talking about land fire. Okay, so land fire is a federal program. It's mapped um, the whole U.S., um, including you know Guam and territories, at 30 meter resolution. 30 meters is because the remote sensing data uh, from Landsat 8 is at 30 meter resolution, and so that kind of forms the base map. So what we're looking at here is fuel models. There's two fuel model systems. The newer one is called Scott and Bergen 40 or FBFM, Fire Behavior Fuel Model 40. There's basically 40 different fuel models, and each of those provide those loadings, you know, tons per acre of one-hour fuels, 10-hour fuels, 100-hour fuels, live woody and live herbaceous, some information about the um, particle size, uh, packing ratio, all the things the Rothermel model needs. So this is the surface fuel mapping for land fire at 30 meter resolution in and around Lake Tahoe. If you want to query one of these, the, these colors are kind of standardized. If you go to landfire.gov, you'll, you'll be able to pull down maps that look real similar to this. Uh, but if you're not already familiar with those colors, you click a point and it tells you timber understory five. And that is uh, high load conifer litter with shrub understory, spread rate is moderate, flame length is moderate. So these are, are mapped across the US. Um, there are other less widely used sources of fuel model inputs. One that we work with is the California Forest Observatory. And actually, let's do that. And I want to switch over. Instead of looking at fuel model, I want to look at canopy cover. So the California Forest Observatory is a, um, a, a product from Salo Sciences. And th instead of using Landsat 8, which is 30 meter, they're using Sentinel-2, which is 10. So they have uh, you know, basically almost 10x resolution uh, compared to, to land fire, and um, it does a much better job at mapping, uh, especially in like the wildland-urban interface. If you look at these areas, let me just turn on the structures so you can see where all the homes are. So there's all these homes you know, in this, this area on the west shore of Lake Tahoe, all, all pretty high-value property. Um, if you look at canopy cover, by dialing up the opacity. So there's what it looks like with the, the, at the 10 meter resolution. And if I flip back over here to say 30 meter resolution, you'll see there's these bare spots where you don't see any canopy cover. And that's because land fire one has those pixels marked as non-burnable. And because they're non-burnable, there's no canopy cover there. So if we were to model a fire here in land fire, it would actually run up 
to those bare spots and just stop. Wouldn't actually impact those structures. The fire spread models don't actually burn structures. They just burn wildland fuels. That's a big limitation. Um, and it's something that, that we're, we're working on and others are, are working on for that matter. So um, there's, there's four main canopy layers plus the surface fuel model for a total of five uh, fuel inputs. So the canopy inputs are canopy bulk density, you know, basically how much mass per unit volume is there. Uh, canopy base height, which is how far above the surface fuels is the, you know, is the bottom of the, of the canopy. And then there's canopy cover, you know, fraction cover um, by, by trees, basically. Um, and then canopy height, how tall are, are the, are the uh, trees in that area or in that pixel. Um, so we also, of course, have topography. So you um, can turn on slope. I think the slope is kind of cool when you look at it in, in 3D because you can, you know, you can kind of zoom in and, and, and look at things. So, yeah, where it's red, it's like 30, 30, I think it's 30 degrees or higher. Yeah, here's the, here's the legend. So the idea here is to put everything in one spot that you need to do fire modeling so you don't have to go hunting around for it and downloading things from different sources. It's all, it's all right here. Um, and uh, these layers are largely static. They get updated as new data comes in. So this is um, Landfire 2.2, also called Landfire 2020, meaning the uh, base maps or the base imagery is from 2020. Landfire 2.3, also called Landfire 2022, is just now rolling out. It's, uh, it's been rolled out for the Southwest and will be rolled out for the rest of the U.S. later. So we'll add that in once those layers become available. Um, and I'll also show you in a bit where you can go and actually download the underlying data, like go to a, a, a web server and, and download um, the actual GIS data. So uh, moving to the right, we've got weather. And I'm going to turn off structures here. So unlike fuels, weather is, of course, changing. And um, what we have over on the left is a, a selection of models. So I know it's, it's probably kind of hard to read up there, but um, there's about seven models, uh, seven forecast models that are pulled in. And those range in resolution from three kilometers for the short range models that go out two to two and a half days uh, to about uh, 13 kilometers for the long range models that go out two weeks or, or more. So this is showing uh, relative humidity. Why don't we look at temperature? I think. I think temperature might be a little more intuitive. And um, whereas the fuel inputs are, are static, there's, of course, a temporal component to weather. So let's switch to coordinated universal time. If you wanted to play this forward and look at how temperature changes in time, uh, you hit that little play button, and it'll, it'll do this flashing. So what it's doing is it's, it's pulling in uh, tiles from a, a geo server that has all this data stored and stylized, meaning you know, making it look pretty. Um, and so the first time you play it through, it'll kind of do this, this flashing. But if you were to back this up, I'll just back it up. And if it's, if it's cached, it'll play much more smoothly. So this, this can show you how, uh, you know, just graphically how temperature is changing over time. Um, a lot of times what you might be interested in is not necessarily how it's changing, you know, geospatially, but at a particular location. So I live around in here in Auburn and the uh, Sierra foothills, and my house is somewhere around in, in here. And so I often go and use this to check what the weather forecast says for, for temperature. And um, after this thinks for a bit, it's going gonna, it's gonna to load a, a graph or a time series. Actually, let me switch to the uh, GFS, which will go out a little bit farther. Um, and so what this will, will do, I swear it'll do it. It might just take a while. Um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to plot a... Um, a graph of, of whatever quantity we're looking at, which in this case is is temperature. And now I'm starting to think maybe it's not going to do it. I <laughs> um, wonder why that is. Let's try another model. Um, so the you know the the this point tool here is used to you know query the uh, you know a particular location um, and create a time series. So and this doesn't happen when I'm looking at this, um, uh, you know, on my computer and not doing a presentation. So I wonder if, um, yeah, it seems like something has happened here because we're not getting any layers coming in from the, from the geo server. 
So, yeah, it looks like, looks like that's what happened. So um, let me just see. Yeah, I don't know if this is an internet thing or something on our end, but um, hmm. all right, well, maybe what I'll do here is, since it looks like this has uh, stopped serving up our data, I'm going to switch back to my presentation and hope that whatever is going on here sort of resolves itself. Um, and then we can continue to, to go through the, um, uh, you know, the, the, additional, the additional layers there. So um, what, I, what I would have shown if, if we didn't have that glitch there is um, the automated fire forecast tool. The way this works is it's, uh, it's pulling in weather forecast data from those models. And it's taking that weather forecast data and using it to... Uh, calculate everything that's needed for fire spread modeling. So that is fuel moistures, that is, of course, wind speed and, and direction, and that then um, feeds into fire spread models. So the, the platform or the application is uh, not dependent on any particular fuel model or any particular fire model, I mean. Uh, so we're using two, currently using two models. One's a, a model called Elm Fire that I've developed and then another is called GridFire, which is a model that Spatial Informatics Group has developed. And um, so those sort of run in parallel, and they create these fire spread forecasts after um, initializing off of the satellite data that I, I pointed out before, and then they're displayed in the, in the application. So um, the inputs, I, I mentioned this kind of you know, real, real briefly. Um, there's a few different sources of the fuel and topography inputs. There's the land fire, uh, you know, kind of wall-to-wall -wall CONUS data. There is uh, data from Pyrologics, uh, Joe Scott. Uh, he, every year, creates uh, for, for a, a number of areas in the U.S. Um, what he calls a fuelscape. And that is a, um, an enhancement or an improvement to the base land fire layers where the, uh, he, he holds calibration workshops uh, with different stakeholders and, you know, basically adjust things so that the fire behavior is more accurately predicted. So it's like an enhanced land fire. I mentioned um, the California Forest Observatory. That's the 10-meter inputs. There's also SEEKS, which is a Center for Ecosystem Climate Solutions. So those are the available inputs. I, I mentioned the, uh, the weather models. There's, there's really three that are used for the, uh, for the forecast part of this. That's the HER, the High Resolution Rapid Refresh, uh, the NAM and uh, the GFS, which um, is a long-range model, goes out to 16 days. And then uh, those are used for calculating dead fuel moistures as well as wind speed and direction. And then the uh, real-time mesoscale analysis, or RTMA, which is an hourly gridded representation at about 2.5 kilometer resolution um, of sensible conditions, so temperature, relative humidity, precipitation, all that, that's used to calculate the live fuel moistures. So that goes into a, a, calcu you know, a calculation that runs um, continuously on a loop, um, and it's updated every six hours. So every six hours, as a new forecast comes in, we're getting a new, a, a new set of data that can be used for fire spread modeling purposes. The um, the near real-time fire inputs, I mentioned uh, these come from four different satellites and also a, a product called FireGuard. Uh, FireGuard is a, it's a, a really high spatial and temporal resolution product. We were um, fortunate enough to be granted access to that through uh, the Forest Service, through our work with the Forest Service. And uh, that's used in conjunction with these, um, these satellite hotspots for, for building you know, fire perimeters. So the the image on the left is a, a perimeter from a fixed-wing aircraft. The one in the middle is hot spots from different satellites, and then the one on the right is a, a fire progression polygon. So basically taking all that data, initializing a fire spread model, and then um, forecasting the, the spread from those, uh, those hot spot data. I, I showed a little bit of the um, kind of situational awareness thing, so that's the Alert wildfire camera feeds, that's the GOES-16 imagery. Um, and this is the, the image on the right. Let's see what fires do we have there. That's going to be from 2020. So um, you think the smoke is bad here now, I can tell you. 
when that was going on in 2020, it was a lot, lot worse. Um, hopefully we don't get a fire year like that again anytime soon. The, um, uh, yeah, this is showing, and it's a little, little dark. That's why I'm, I was using this other machine here for, for, my, um, uh, for the Pyrocast demo. Um, but if you look closely through this kind of dark part, you can see it. I think that's Shasta Lake, which you, can, you could see up here if it was a little, a little bit lighter. Um, so this is an example of, you know, kind of lining that camera up with the modeled fire spread so that we can you know, kind of see how the model's doing. Are we getting fire and flames in the, in the same places that, um, that we're seeing them in the, you know, in the real-time camera feeds? So uh, the computational models that are used it are... I'm going to see if I can make this a little bit brighter. Made it darker. <laughs> All right. Um, there it goes. Well, the, the forecasts that we're running are in ensemble forecasts. What that means is that rather than running one rendition of a fire spread model, we're running hundreds. Uh, we found about 200 is about the right amount. So whenever a, a fire spread forecast is initiated, the, um, each of the models, in this case Elm Fire and Grid Fire, kick off and they run uh, each 200 uh, basic variations of this, you know, of the same simulation, and what's varied is the input parameters. There's considerable uncertainty in uh, things like wind speed and direction, fuel moisture, um, spotting is included in these models as a, you know, it's a stochastic parameter. So um, these inputs are perturbed from their baseline values, and so what you get is a family of forecasts. And uh, typically, what we would do is pick out different spread or different fire size percentiles. So like the 50th percentile is the median fire size across those 200 ensemble members. The 90th percentile is larger than, um, you know, 90% of the other fires. And then that is what gets displayed um, in the forecast tool for, you know, for the, uh, the given uh, particular fire. So this animation on the right is showing spread of... Uh, 24-hour forecast, and it's condensed to a, a, a two, you know, kind of a two-second animation. And what varies from forecast to forecast is the um, those inputs. So they're being they're being per perturbed. And um, the Elm Fire model is a uh, Eulerian level set method for fire spread. It's based on the the level set method, which I'll talk about here in a little bit. And um, it's available. It's on GitHub, so you can. Let's see. I'm gonna have to type this in. So if you go to like, uh, what is it? GitHub.com, Wattenberger, Elmfire. Um, you know, it's just like any other any other repo. If you wanted to grab the source code, you can copy this, and uh, that's the the URL. You do Git. Uh, clone and, and then that will grab the source code, um, but also there's a uh, a site that will you know kind of show you how to get things set up and running locally on your machine. Elmfire.io just because Elmfire.com was taken, which I was quite surprised by, but um, apparently there's another model called called Elmfire out there. And so to uh, to get started, um, first you have to run this in Linux. I'm sorry. If you're not a Linux person, but if you're going to do anything in, in uh, wildfire modeling, most everything runs under Linux these days. So um, it's really quite simple. You, you basically just uh, install some packages and then set a few environment variables. This kind of walks you through it. Uh, you have to actually build the executables, which means take the source code, compile it to something that can be run. And then once you're at that point, you're, you're in a good spot where you can um, go back and, and start uh, some of the tutorials. So we put together a few simple tutorials that um, uh, it, you know, kind of walk you through how, how to run the, you know, these models. And it starts with the simplest possible <coughs> case, which is fire spread in flat terrain under constant wind. This is just showing how to, how to set it up. But once you are able to, to run this, you'll, uh, if you do it correctly at least, Get a, a nice elliptical fire, you know, uh, fire shape here, where the, uh, the black lines are isochrones. Isochrone just means like the the position of the fire at a fixed point in time, 
and in this case, the, um, the color is the fire line intensity when that pixel burned. So the highest fire line intensity, because this fire is spreading from north to south, is along the center line, and then as the fire is backing and flanking, uh, you know, on, on its heel and in its flanks, it's getting, you know, lower fire line intensity. So um, kind of moving on in terms of, of complexity, the, the next case is rather than having like a, a constant wind, a, a, a changing wind, a shifting wind, so this is showing a fire spreading initially under a north wind that becomes a northeast wind and pushes the fire to the, to, to the west. Um, we want to, of course, not run everything in idealized fuels. So this is a, a tutorial that shows how to, uh, you know, basically pull in real fuels. And one of the things that I'm, um, you know, I'm, I'm really excited about is the microservices that were put together to allow you to pull in the fuel data. So one of the hard parts, or maybe the hardest part, about you know just the mechanics of running fire models is getting all your data, right? You have to go to Landfire, download some rasters, get them clipped to a certain tile, get your fire initialization data, uh, get it all in the same projection, basically the same coordinate system, and it's a huge hassle. And so what runs the fire forecast system under the hood is these Python-based microservices where, you know, from a command line, you just say, uh, here's the latitude and longitude I'm interested in, give me Landfire 2.2.0, and give me a 16-day forecast. And it takes about five or six seconds, and then um, that that downloads to your you know to your local machine. So um, it's really streamlined the the whole process of, of of running the models, and it you know makes it possible to sort of um, start really doing detailed studies on validation and verification, understanding where the models perform well, where they don't perform well, uh, because it you know it it just makes that process something that is really you know scriptable that you know can be can be coded up in, in python or whatever your language of choice is um, and so this is showing um, basically the same wind field for the previous case and uh, in real in real world fuels this time instead of in um, idealized fuels um, the models can also be used for uh, something like a flam map analysis if you're familiar with flam map uh, what flam map does is it burns every pixel on the landscape as a head fire. And so it's, uh, it's good for looking at fire potential. So given a certain set of you know, uh, conditions, which would be fuel moisture, wind, et cetera, are there certain areas on the landscape that, uh, with everything else being equal, would burn with higher intensity? So this is showing how to go and set that up. And then uh, what we have down here, this is uh, modeled flame length. So where it's uh, bright red, flame length is 60 feet or higher, which is typically going to be crown fire. Um, and where it's green, it's probably you know, 10 or 20. So the, the top image there is for a, a no wind case, you know, basically zero mile per hour wind. And then the bottom is for a sustained wind of 25 miles per hour, which is you know, quite, quite extreme. Um, there's some verification and validation cases. So um, if you're not familiar with the terminology, it generally, verification refers to checking the math. Are the equations implemented correctly in the model? Um, and typically, the way you do that is by comparing a, a model calculation to an analytical solution, which there aren't a whole lot of in wildland fire, frankly. Um, and it's a little bit different than validation. Validation refers to, you know, is the model, how well does the model predict or forecast reality? Um, you know, that could be, a measure of um, spread, so how, uh, how big is the fire after three days? Does that match um, what occurred um, in reality? It could also be things like flame length. Is the, uh, is the fire behavior being correctly modeled? Because you could conceivably have a model that gets the spread right, but has the flame lengths way off. So um, that's really been an area, I think, that um, we could use some more rigor in, uh, you know, in wildland fire modeling in particular. If you're familiar with the verification and validation guides in FDS, they are incredible, right? The uh, FDS validation guide is probably eight or 900 pages at this point. It covers dozens and dozens of experiments with hundreds and hundreds, probably thousands of, of data points where um, the FDS calculations are compared to those. 
Um, there really isn't anything like that in, in wildland fire, and I think that's because it's you know much harder to run a well-instrumented wildfire experiment than it is to run a compartment fire experiment or a, a pool fire experiment, the you know, types of things that FDS is typically used for. But um, nonetheless, we have a, a few real simple uh, verification cases. Um, we saw the elliptical fire shape in, in Mark's uh, presentation, or maybe it was Jason's this morning. So you can actually put together an analytical solution for elliptical, elliptical fire spread for you know, basically no slope uh, fixed wind conditions or no wind fixed slope conditions. It's basically the same in, in the raw thermal model. This just shows some of the math that can be used to set that up. And, and then uh, this is a comparison of the, you know, sort of the analytical solution to uh, the modeled solution, you know, the numerical, numerical solution. And then there's, there's a similar one for, uh, for Crown Fire as well. And uh, this is just kind of walking through the, the same types of things. So um, validation, this is, um, this is an active area where, or this is an area of active work, I should say, where, um, you know, we're, we're, we're starting to put together a validation suite for some fires that are easy to model and some that aren't easy to model. And um, what this will show is that there are some fires uh, this is the 2018 County Fire, which burned in, in Northern California. Um, what it'll show is that for some fires, the models do a reasonably well job, and for other models, they completely miss the boat, especially um, plume-dominated fires. We wouldn't expect these simple, uncoupled models to be able to simulate something like the uh, 2020 Creek Fire, uh, which was in the news because it, it grew explosively, uh, around the area of Shaver Lake and, and kind of the Sierra foothills. And um, because it grew so explosively and so unexpectedly, there was about 200 people that had to be airlifted out by helicopter. Really scary kind of situation. Uh, but what this is showing is for the, you know, for the county fire, how you can set up and, and run a, a fire spread model and then compare um, what the model says happened to what actually happened. You know, start looking at the... Uh, you know, difference between the modeled perimeter and the, you know, sort of the, the observed perimeter. Um, so that's the, you know, that's kind of the, um, you know, for, for one of the spread models at least, that is the, the current state of things. The second spread model called GridFire um, has a similar set of tools and documentation, and it's going to be released here um, pretty soon. All of the source code for the, the web application as well, that's also open source. Um, it needs some documentation and a little bit of cleanup before it gets released. But um, once the project, once the CEC project is complete, all the things that we're looking at and talking about here are going to be available on, you know, on, on GitHub. Um, you know, and the, the motivation there is to really um, provide a starting point for folks like yourselves um, and others that... Um, uh, you know, may maybe want to work on some corner of the model, spotting or crown fire or, um, you know, one of the low list, one of the items in the list that uh, Jason showed at the end, all the limitations. Those are, there's so much work to do in this area. Um, there's, you know, there's a, a, a big need for um, folks to come in and, and um, help improve some of the parts of the models that we know don't work well. Uh, for example, in almost all cases, these these model or these fires are modeled as unsuppressed. But in almost all cases, fires are of course not unsuppressed, right? So we're comparing a heavily suppressed actual fire in some case to a largely, not largely, an entirely unsuppressed model. Um, and so, in addition to you know working on things like uh, Mark and Jason talked about this morning with regard to improving fire physics, there's also a, a really dire need to um, look at how suppression can be modeled. Uh, folks are starting to look at using AI, agent-based, you know, kind of AI-type models for, for looking at suppression, but it's a, a real kind of new research area with, um, you know, a lot of opportunities to make some, some good progress. Um, user guide, um, won't go through that. It's really um, not that interesting. <laughs> and then the technical reference, which is like the you know, the underlying um, spread rate formulation, how the Eulerian level set model works, and, and things like that. So that's the, um, that's the 
uh, the Elmfire model, coming back to the, the presentation here. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, the Eulerian level set method, because it's actually a really powerful uh, method. I, I first learned about this as a grad student at, uh, at Cal, working or, or in a combustion class where uh, we were talking about premixed combustion. So the level set method um, is used to track curved surfaces on a grid, and it has lots and lots of applications. One is premixed combustion, where you have a burned gas and an unburned gas separated by a flame front. That's actually a pretty good analogy for wildfire, if you think about it. We've got a burned area and an unburned area, and that's separated by the, the fire line. So the way the level set method works is by, by solving a, a partial differential equation for a variable typically called phi or phi. And that has no physical meaning except at the fire line, if we're talking about wildland fires, where phi equals zero. Um, so the image on the left is showing how that phi field evolves in 3D space. And if you take the kind of ISO contour where phi equals zero, that gives you the thing in the middle. And so that's how the fire front is tracked. It's basically by integrating a, a hyperbolic partial differential equation uh, given at the top there. And the uh, UX there and UY, those are the X and Y velocities. Those come from the raw thermal model. At least currently they come from the raw thermal model. And um, one of the assumptions that is implicit to the level set method is that the fire front spreads only in the direction perpendicular to, um, to the fire front. So think about that. The fire can only spread perpendicular to itself. And we can calculate the, uh, the normal vector, the unit normal vector, from the gradient of the, of the phi field, figure out which direction the fire line is pointing in each grid cell. And then the, uh, the next step there uh, which I'll, 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 I'll show on the next slide, is to uh, figure out how quickly that's spreading. And that uses the raw thermal model, which, um, as was mentioned this morning, has been you know, really the workhorse in the U.S. operational system for, for over 50 years now at, at this point. But the, um, the raw thermal model only gives spread rate in the head fire direction, but we need to calculate spread rate in all the other directions. So um, there's really two steps that are involved there. Um, the first involves vectoring the raw thermal model. So um, what this is showing, this is, you know, this is basically like high school, um, you know, it's not calculus, but I guess just vector addition, right? If you have a wind blowing, um, in this case, out of the west toward the east, the fire is going to go this way. And if it's also spreading up slope, then the slope wants to drive it this way. And so you, you do basically vector addition to get, you know, a spread to the northeast in, in this case. So the first step is to take the, uh, the, the wind aspect or the wind direction, calculate the spread rate aligned with the wind. And then the second step is to calculate the same thing, but for slope. Then you add those together and you get a spread rate in, in what's called the direction of maximum spread. And that's done at each point along the fire line. So for each point along the fire line, we can calculate the direction of maximum spread and what the, what the spread rate is in that direction. But remember, the fire only spreads perpendicular to itself. So you have to do basically a vector dot product um, to figure out the spread rate in that direction perpendicular to, to, the, uh, to the, the fire front. And the, the, the details, I, I promise you, are not that interesting, but... Um, what I will say is that it's all based on the properties of an ellipse. So every point along the fire front is assumed to be an elliptical wavelet. And um, what that does is uh, generalizes the raw thermal model to not just the head fire direction, but also spread in all other directions. And there's some, um, again, really not particularly interesting um, calculus and, and uh, solid body rotation that is done to, to make this all work. But at the end of the day, what comes out of this is the UX and UY that are needed for the level set method to evolve that phi field in time and figure out how the, how the uh, fire front moves and spreads. And so the um, end result is, again, these, these nice ellipses where um, on the left, we're looking at time of arrival. The blue areas burned first. The red areas burned later. 
And then on the right is fire line intensity, um, which again is like the one we looked at before where um, fire spreads or the flame length or fire line intensity, they're, they're, they're related of course, is uh, higher in the head fire direction and lower in the backing and, and flanking direction. <coughs> the, um, uh, the crown fire model that's used, we tested a few and uh, landed on the, uh, the crown fire model by Cruz et al., and um, the other one that's used is uh, also a raw thermal model. Uh, but uh, as you can see from these plots here, um, the Cruz model uh, correlates better with experimental data than the raw thermal 91 model does. Uh, so in these plots here on the right, the, um, the x-axis is the uh, sort of the observed spread rate. The y-axis, uh, sorry, it's the other way around. X-axis is or uh, y-axis is observed rate of spread, x is, um, is modeled, and then the line of perfect agreement is the 45-degree line there. Um, so the Cruz model does a little bit better job than the raw thermal model for, for crown fires. Uh, spotting is a real important part, especially under high winds. And again, we've tried a few different approaches. Um, the Albini spotting model that was mentioned earlier is really the uh, kind of the, the classic approach that's used in Farsight and the operational models used by the Forest Service. Um, we like the uh, a, a statistical or a, a stochastic approach that uh, treats the spotting distance as a log normal distribution. And that log normal distribution is a function of a few things like fire line intensity, wind speed. And so what it shows or what it gives is a, a probability density function for spotting distance, uh, which is the on the x-axis, uh, and then uh, the y-axis is, is that, that PDF there. Um, and so for, say, a 2,000 kilowatt per meter fire line intensity with a 20-foot wind speed of 10 miles per hour, the spotting distribution looks something like this. If we go to more intense fires with higher winds, what happens is that curve shifts to the right, and so you get more embers traveling you know, farther, farther distances. So um, there's a, a couple different ways that, that you can treat spotting. This is an area of all the models, frankly, that needs a, a lot of uh, improvement. And um, Arnaud's student, Yuren, who I don't see here, so I, I, I think he's probably in the overflow room, one of the things he's working on is um, making this grid independent. It's currently dependent on the grid size and also time step independent. He's doing some really cool work uh, where the particles are treated in an Eulerian or grid-based um, frame of reference as opposed to a Lagrangian uh, frame of reference. So um, this was going to come at the end. I'm going to cross my fingers and hope that whatever was going on on the, uh, the Pyrocast site has resolved itself. And it looks like it just may have, because we now see some land fire data that wasn't there before. So. Uh, let's see if we got weather. Okay, we're back online, good. So, I think I was about to go into, oh, I know what I was trying to do. I was trying to show a plot of temperature at my house, wasn't I? Um, all right, so, yeah, it's working again. Um, so, let's see, go back to temperature. So, anyway, yeah, you get the, you get the, um, you know, the, the idea that we can take a particular point of interest, and depending on you know the the model, create a graph of uh, in this case temperature as a function of of time. Um, but you know this is really meant to be a fire forecast tool. So let's look at some fire specific things. So um, vapor pressure deficit is a better metric for the drying force than relative humidity. Uh, basically, the higher the vapor pressure deficit, the uh, let's see if we can get something in the southwest where we have some decent vapor pressure deficit. The higher the vapor pressure deficit, the more drying force there is. And so this dries out uh, both uh, live fuels and dead fuels. It actually causes live fuels to, uh, to respirate and give up some of their moisture to the atmosphere. Um, there's really two main kind of meteorological indices. These are not fire danger indices. These are, these are basically fire weather indices. Um, that correlate with large fire development. The first is called the Fosberg Fire Weather Index. And uh, Fosberg is, um, 
when Fosberg index is 50 or higher for a period of three hours or more, that typically is problematic from a fire weather perspective. And uh, Fosberg uses relative humidity, temperature, and wind speed to create a fuel-independent measure of, of fire weather. So basically, the higher, higher the index, the uh, more potential there is for fire spread independent of, of what the fuel is. Um, a, probably a more physically correct uh, fire weather index would be the hot, dry, windy index. And what the hot, dry, windy index does is quite similar. It combines um, vapor pressure deficit with wind speed, vapor pressure deficit being a better measure of drying force. Um, hot, dry, windy correlates quite well with large fire development. So there's a few other fire-specific things in here, and one of those is firebrand ignition probability. And um, I, I should put an asterisk next to this because this is... Uh, this is not actually the ignition probability of a firebrand, but it's a calculation method that was developed in the in the late '60s that is widely used by the uh, by the the U.S. agencies. Uh, it's actually the ignition component in the National Fire Danger Rating System, but um, it's useful qualitatively for looking at how trends change in in time. And what you know, the reason why you're seeing this up and down each day is because there is uh, these diurnal cycles, right? The sun comes out during the day, temperature goes up, relative, uh, relative humidity goes down, and that causes the uh, firebrand ignition probability to reach a maximum, usually 2 or 3 p.m. in the afternoon, and then it reaches a minimum maybe 5 or 6 a.m. In, in the morning. And so that's what's causing the, those ups and downs. I um, also have in here the fine dead fuel moisture content, um, which is really the one-hour fuel moisture. Um, it's uh, it's actually the equilibrium fuel moisture, but for all intents and purposes, it's the you know it's the same as the one hour fuel moisture content. So um, a few different things that are uh, available here: the um, the HER model, which is the high resolution rapid refresh. I'm going to just show something that I think might be of interest to folks here. Actually, has a smoke forecast, so it's the only operational model, at least that I'm aware of, that. Um, is is taking you know satellite hotspot data, using it to initialize a smoke forecast, and then um, you know kind of projecting that forward in in time. So let me let me just back this up, and I'll kind of let it let it play and do its um, do its initialization here. There it goes. Um, so so what this is doing is uh, basically assimilating or incorporating the hotspot data into a forecast that is tracking where smoke will go. Now, it's a simple uh, forecast in that it's not actually projecting any spread in fire growth or any, any change in fire growth or any spread of the fire, but it's saying, all right, let's say the fire remains static in this area. It's got this you know, uh, intensity, this amount of uh, smoke generation, and it's actually um, you know, advecting and diffusing that smoke as it um, as it moves forward in time, and so now that that's cached, if you let that sit here and play, it should be a little little bit smoother. Um, and so we can do the same thing. I know um, everybody's wondering when the smoke is going to clear. So let's see what the uh, what the smoke model says here for for our neck of the woods. Uh, if we zoom in, uh, that's too far north. So we're around in here somewhere, College Park. So this is what the model says is going to happen here. It uh, looks like a peak. Let me change to, oh, we're already in local time. So it looks like we're going to have a little bit of smoke. Let me dial up the opacity. A little bit of smoke, and that's going to be tomorrow at, or that's tomorrow morning, so 4 a.m., which makes sense. Um, a stable atmosphere, lots of smoke. Yeah? Are you aware of a firesmoke.ca by Canada? No, I'm not. <laughs> it's the same in they have like a smoke forecast for Okay, cool. Uh, what does it say? <laughs> <laughs> does it, it would be really cool if it says the same thing. That would give us okay. some, some clarity. <laughs> <laughs> okay. F eleven, what is it called? Firesmoke.ca. Firesmoke.ca, okay. This one, view current forecast. 
Okay, so I can tell from looking, this is a high split based model in all likelihood. Um, high split is a, a plume trajectory model. It's doing similar things to what the HER is doing, um, but it's using um, a combination. You heard Craig Clements mention uh, Briggs. It's using the Briggs equations to model smoke um, under a, a prescribed wind field. So, um, yeah, thanks. I, I will definitely look at this and tell my wife about it who arrives tomorrow and is kind of worried it's going to ruin our... <laughs> our sightseeing in, in DC. Um, okay, so let's see. Um, I know we're kind of running short on time here, so let me get to like the fun part. So there's um, a couple, uh, couple things here um, related specifically to fire. So Mark talked about the large-scale Monte Carlo analysis that's used for annualized burn probability modeling. That's run in a model called FSIM, and it uses historical fire ignition data um, from 92, 1992 to 2020. It's about 2.2 million ignitions in there. And um, that's used to you know, identify the areas where fires are more likely to occur. And then the dryness is used to kind of ramp that up during the summer and down in the winter, typ typically, although, although not always. Um, this is doing the same thing, except um, in a forecast mode. So this is for, let me pause it, see if we can get it to, to cache. I hope we're not having the, um, whatever the problem, problem was earlier. Um, so what this is doing is igniting fires across California at, um, you know, basically hourly out to 120 hours. So it's going out five days, it's igniting fires, and it's modeling their spread across the landscape and figuring out, um, you know, basically which areas are more likely to burn than, you know, than others. So it's a, a forecast of burn probability, rel relative burn probability. And um, what this is used for is sort of identifying hot spots. You know, in other words, areas where, um, oh, I'm in the dev tool. That's... That's at least part of the problem. Let me go back to the, this is the production tool. So um, same thing, risk, and this should, this should be uh, better than the, the development tool that I was in. Um, dial up the opacity and go to fire area. So what this is showing is um, basically how big fires would get at least how big the model says fires would get in six hours of spread. And so these are the areas where, you know, at least in Southern California, where there is the highest potential for ignition and, and spread. And this is showing fires getting to eh, 1,500 acres in six hours, which for, for this area is pro probably about right, um, given some of the historical fires. And um, some of the other things that we want to look at are uh, the number of impacted structures. So are there areas where um, due to the, you know, kind of co-location of structures with uh, fuels and, and uh, you know, po possibly high, high winds, are there areas where uh, we have some concerns about structure impacts? So what this is showing here is for a fire igniting uh, 7 p.m. today in this area here, uh, after six hours, there's 80 structures within the perimeter. So um, there's the structures. You can, can kind of look at the satellite imagery to figure out what's happening. So this is, I don't know if this meets Alex, Alex's definition of, of, uh, of wild and urban interface or not, but I would say this is, you know, this is intermixed probably. Um, you know, maybe one house per per acre, uh, maybe one house per every, you know, two to five acres. And um, these are the areas where we tend to have bad fires at damaged structures in California. So this is doing a, you know, probably a pretty good job at, a, you know, sort of identifying this as a, as a hot spot. Um, but there are, you know, there's many, many others as, as well. The, um, the second uh, ignition pattern, I remember this is funded by the, the Energy Commission, is transmission lines. So this is doing the same type of thing, but rather than um, igniting fires according to historical fire currents, it's constraining those ignitions to power lines. 
And so I turned on the, um, the black lines or the location of those transmission lines. And then what we have here is the number of impacted structures for fires starting under power lines. So it looks like this might be a little bit of a hot spot. So this is showing uh, around 50 structures impacted after uh, six hours. There's those structures. We can, rather than looking at impacted structures, go to relative burn probability. And this is showing basically where the fire would come off of those power lines in six hours and, and spread to. And so uh, both of these ignition patterns, the, um, you know, basically the all-cause fires and then the transmission line-caused fires, um, we're currently running around 200 million simulations per day for each of those. And when we get into August and September, once things have dried out and the, you know, the dryness has, has caused there to be more ignitions, we'll be running around a, a billion per day for, for each. So this is kind of what Mark was mentioning, is that these models have to run very quickly to be useful, um, especially if you're doing something like a large-scale Monte Carlo simulation to, uh, to help quantify risk. Um, and this updates once a day. So every day, um, so we're looking at yesterday's simulation uh, that loaded last night, and the one that launched this morning will load later tonight. So every 24 hours, uh, there's a new, a new forecast. Um, if, if I were to log in over here, if I were a, an energy company, what I would see in addition to these lines is my own or that company's own line. So um, th this is used primarily for de-energization, are there areas where, uh, if there's a high wind event in the forecast, where the risk is just so high um, that it makes sense to de-energize proactively to prevent fires because the consequences of there being an ignition is, is so dire that um, there's really no, no resort or, or no choice other than this kind of last resort choice to, to de-energize. Um, so that is a, you know, an, a, an aspect that... Um, is being you know sort of beta tested by some early adopters at, at this at this point, and then uh, really the the main thing that this system is used for is uh, forecasting the spread of active fires. So when you land, you'll on this page you'll land on the active fires tab, and uh, there's really not a whole lot of fire activity going on right now. This this demo is a lot better in August or September when when uh, there's lots of of fires and last. Late August into early September last year, there was between 60 and 70 active fires that were being tracked by this. And so the system is just pulling in that satellite data, initializing new fire spread forecasts, and then uh, projecting spread. So the, the, really the only active fire, really active fire right now is called the Pass Fire. It's in uh, New Mexico, and it's at about, looks like 46,000 acres, 13% containment. That's the formal containment. The effective containment is likely much higher. This fire is probably 80 or 90 percent contained. Um, and what happened, this fire ignited somewhere around in here, uh, back around May 20th. And if you look at the surrounding fire history, it actually ignited in an area where there hasn't been, it hasn't burned, whereas most of the area around it has burned within the last 20 years. And so... Um, near as I could tell, the decision was made to basically let this burn. The conditions are, are mild. Uh, it was a wet winter. There isn't, um, uh, there isn't a whole lot of wind in the forecast. And so this thing has just been kind of munching along at two or 3,000 acres a day for, for a few weeks now. And um, it's being actively managed by an incident management team, of, of course. Um, but what, our, you know, what we can look at here is... Uh, what the modeled spread of this fire is. I'm going to turn off the uh, hotspot data and kind of show you what we're, what we're looking at here. So the blue, those are areas that the algorithm um, has figured out or thinks, because it's not always right, but at least the algorithm thinks that those areas are cold and will not spread. The areas that are purple are areas that the algorithm uh, has identified as being burning at the start of the forecast. Okay, uh, and so what we're going to see when I let this thing play here is fire. It will start to spread off of those purple areas because those are those are the you know uh, latest hot spots that have come in from uh, Veers and, and Modus. You can kind of see that here. So fire is spreading, you know, primarily off of this area here because that was recently 
uh, sense to be hot by the satellites. It's going to do this weird caching thing where it's going to kind of kind of flash for for a while. Um, if I let that go for uh, for for a little bit here, and then back it up, it'll play much more smoothly. So now if I if I change this to to two x, um, you'll actually see the you know the fire starting to spread off of those <laughs> those areas where it's hot. Um, so I mentioned these fire size percentiles. What I'm going to do, I'm just going to drag this out to a week from now. So this is the modeled spread after a week. This fire was uh, was initialized, looks like, is today the 8th or the 9th? Yeah, it looks like it was just very recently initialized, about an hour ago. So um, so while we were talking, what, what happened, there was some new heat being sensed, whether it's from FireGuard or these satellites that was pulled in, forecast was initiated, and... Um, then this 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 forecast uh, ends up being displayed here. So going out to seven days, we can look at the modeled spread out to a week. That's the 50th percentile spread. This assumes no suppression, right? Which there will of course be suppression. Um, we can look at say the 10th percentile spread. This is the smallest from those ensembles or that ensemble, and then this is the 90th. So what this does is provides kind of a range of modeled spread. And that is useful, especially if you have a fire like this, it's burning for, for weeks. You can get an idea of um, how well the model is doing. If the model underpredicted spread yesterday, it's probably going to underpredict spread today. And so what you might want to do is use the 70th percentile forecast as your, your best guess, um, as opposed to like the median forecast or the 50th percentile forecast, which is usually the kind of our, our best our best guess. Um, these these forecasts are actually run out to two weeks. Um, they're after a few days. They're really more fantasy than anything else, frankly, uh, just because with all the limitations of these models and the weather models and so on, there just really isn't much predictive skill out that far. But nonetheless, uh, if you click this modeled perimeter, what it will show, this red area is the two-week modeled spread for this fire at the 50th percentile. If we go out to the 90th, that's the 90th percentile spread, and then the kind of more optimistic 10th percentile spread um, is there. So, uh, so, so this is basically running on a loop, um, looking for new fires. We typically get fires, uh, once they're detected and named, after an ignition occurs, they will typically appear here in about 10 minutes. Um, so this runs you know, really quickly um, on a, you know, on a, using it like an automated, uh, auto automated process. And uh, this isn't meant to replace like a fire behavior analyst uh, or a long-term analyst. You know. This is meant to complement that. So, um, this is really like a quick look. Um, it provides a starting point that can be used for additional, you know, additional analysis. Um, if you want to uh, get the data, it's all out there. So you'd go to, I think you go to data.pyrecast.org. Oh, I don't know how to spell data.pyrecast. And... Uh, it's a real simple web server. Um, go into fire spread forecast, and here's all the fires that, that are currently in the system. So this is the New Mexico Pass fire. These are the initialization times. And so I think the one we were just looking at is 1941. The, the time is in Coordinated Universal Time, or UTC. And um, these are all the underlying data files. So this hour is since burned. That's what we were just looking at. So you can download, you can you know pull this into QGIS or whatever your your GIS platform is. Um, there's also an API uh, if you go to, uh, and this is all this is all linked off of the main page. But um, more often than not, people are bringing this data in not by going and downloading the underlying data files, but by getting a a, a web web map service or a, you know basically a data feed. And so you go here, you just copy this. Uh, to your, you know, to your clipboard, and then you can go into QGIS or Esri, ArcMap, or whatever, and um, you know, pull that in as a web map service. And so all the, basically all the data that is in this portal, this application here, is um, is available either for download from that site or by pulling it in by an API. 
And then um, I, was ac I accidentally ended up over in this development tool here. Uh, this is a different, uh, different site. We basically have a production site that is public facing. That's, that's the one we were looking at for most of the presentation. And then the development happens in kind of a sandbox that's isolated from this other stuff. But one of the cool things that's coming down um, the pipeline here shortly is a, is a match drop tool. So you can actually, um, once you're logged in and authenticated and so on, submit a fire name, you know, um, what is today, Thursday? Call it the Thursday fire. And you can ignite both historical fires. You can ignite fires under, I think, back to 2011 under historical weather conditions or as a forecast. And uh, what you do is you just click on the... Uh, you know, wherever, wherever you want to light that fire, maybe we should put it over here where it looks like it might actually get something to grow and spread. Um, we'll pick a time. Uh, we'll ignite it uh, like a couple hours ago. Um, so let's see. We'll back it up to say, I don't know, 12. Okay, and then submit. And then what's happened is it just submitted this to a queue. The, the computers are running now. They're pulling in weather data. Um, they're going to run this fire. And then it will show up here. It takes a little bit longer now than, than we'd like. Um, ideally, this should take less than, than a minute. So here's some stuff that I was running earlier. Um, ran a couple fires. Very first test, summer school, Maryland. You can tell I, I don't have a whole lot of creativity when it comes to fire names. Um, but then the, what happens is uh, for a particular user, those fires then will show up, uh, if we're in the dev site, which we are, they will show up over here. I didn't get any real good fires to, to burn because it's, it's kind of hard to get stuff to burn in California right now. But here is the, uh, this is the summer school match drop fire. And so there it is, tiny little baby fire. Um, but anyway, so, so this is, this is kind of cool because you can, you know, just like look at what if scenarios. What if a fire starts here at this location, drop a pin, a uh, minute later it'll show up here and do that for, uh, you know, forecast conditions, historical weather conditions, and so on. So um, this is definitely um, a work in progress, meaning there's a lot of things happening, a lot of things going on. Um, there's so much to do here. It's really, it's a really... Um, in some ways, a little bit overwhelming. <laughs> but um, I, I hope you now see what I mean when I said at the beginning that we chose to develop a framework as opposed to really working on the underlying spread models. And so the idea here is that, um, you know, when Mark's model and Jason's model is ready, um, maybe that could get plugged into Elm Fire and Grid Fire or another model. Or if some team comes up with something that doesn't need the raw thermal model, maybe an AI-based model, I mean, that wouldn't be frankly, all that surprising if somebody figures out how to actually get better spread forecasts from something that doesn't use raw thermal or doesn't use the underlying physical um, equations by, you know, by training a model on hundreds or thousands, probably, you know, tens of thousands of, of fires, for, for example. So um, anyway, I think that about wraps up uh, what I wanted to say here. I know I went a little bit, well, I guess we still have 10 minutes left. So uh, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I apologize for the technical glitches, but that's what happens when you do a live demo. So um, anyway, thank you for your attention. I appreciate it. This is a great example of how you can go from fundamental science and working in you know, your corner on wild and dry behavior, trying to put that information into a spread model and this model find this way risk engineering tools and tools that can be used by people on the ground for different applications. So, yeah, thank you for that. We have time for questions. Yeah. Uh, what order of magnitude of time would it take to run Elfire on a local installation? Oh, sec seconds to microseconds. Uh, yeah, one of the, um, I should, I'll just talk about the hardware that runs this. So, there is... 512 computational cores that do all the um, risk modeling, basically the Monte Carlo simulation and the active fires. And, you know, we can run several, you know, like literally several billion fires in a 24-hour period on um, 
256 cores, saving the other 256 cores for, for active fires. Um, but like the, the test cases that I showed or like the um, tutorial cases, those run in fractions of a second. It actually takes longer to do the post-processing in most cases than it does to actually run the models. They're really, they're really quite efficient. Um, and they're, they're scalable. So as, as part of a project with uh, First Street Foundation, um, which is one of our, our partners, um, Amazon Web Services, AWS, donated over a million, actually I don't know how many, it's a lot, a lot of CPU hours, and they have like a million core challenge. So um, the idea is to run the kind of national scale burn probability modeling in a day or two, um, you know, by basically dividing the, the world or at least the U.S. up into these little tiles. Um, and that would take, you know, a very, very long time if you were to, like, try to run that on a machine or, or two. I, I mean years. It would take years, literally. So, um, yeah, kind of a long-winded answer. The, the, the answer to your question is very quickly. <laughs> uh, very impressive work. Thank you. Uh, I saw that you have, like, historical fires, like, uh-huh. Uh, would, would it be possible uh, in the future, or is it available now, having also the conditions for those fires so they can be, be produced with various models and do some type of benchmarking? You mean the weather, the weather conditions in, in particular? Yeah, so part of um, so the, the, what I call the microservices, all that is explained in the tutorials and the, the user guide and so on, but that allows you to pull in um, historical wind speed and direction, uh, fuel moistures, and a couple other, other things uh, from 2011 to current. So as long as they burn in the last you know, 12 years or so, um, you can pull in that data. Now that comes from the RTMA, the real-time mesoscale analysis. So um, it's kind of like a first step, you know, use at your own discretion kind of, kind of thing. Um, there, you know, there might be areas where the RTMA just doesn't ac accurately represent conditions, but it's a good starting point. Thank you. Um, My question is, uh, is this apl applied to the United States, or can it be applied elsewhere? Second, who paid for this, and how will this be supported? Um, so the main limitation for scaling beyond the U.S. is the Rothermel model only works with U.S. fuels. And we don't have fuel data elsewhere. We can run the weather models everywhere. Um, the GFS is global, uh, for example. So um, there is definitely interest in expanding beyond uh, the U.S., but at, at this point we're really limited based on fuel, of, you know, uh, fuel availability data. Um, the funding source, this is all public, so there's nothing confidential here, but... Uh, the California Energy Commission funded this at a level of $5 million over four years, five years maybe, um, and that is all for working groups. So um, moving forward, there is um, funding from the U.S. Forest Service to maintain this through 2028, I believe. It's a fi five years, um, and that's used not for... Um, operational, like, uh, firefighting purposes, but for prioritization of resources. So um, it's one of the tools, not the only one, but one of three tools that is used by the Forest Service for looking at um, where should resources go, the others being the, um, the typical WIFDIS, Wildfire Decision Support System tools, um, which is near-term fire behavior, NTFB, and FS Pro um, fire spread probability. Those are run by uh, FBANs and LTANs, fire behavior analysts and long-term analysts. This is a complement to that and is meant to provide a quick look, run on a loop without having an, um, somebody manually run a, a fire. So um, I think that this project is going to continue for, uh, for, for quite some time. Uh, there's enough interest um, and enough partners in, involved that... Um, that are committed to developing open source free, freely available tools that uh, I think we'll probably still be talking about this in five, maybe even 10 years. Hopefully it'll be a lot better in five or 10 years, but um, we'll see. <laughs> yeah, uh, this is really awesome. Um, I was just curious if there's plans to like distill down the active fires or the risk section to like an iOS app for people who are like not as 
knowledgeable on fire is like the people in this room. We have con- we have conversations about that all the, all the time. I I always the test I use is the my mom test. Would my mom know how to use this? And right now I don't think she would. Um, so one of the things that we we've started doing is distilling, you know, rather than having this tool where you can navigate and move forward and backward in time, print a one page PDF thing for each forecast that shows. You know, maybe a snapshot of the final perimeter and provide some real high level, um, provide some real you know high level summaries like this acreage after five days, this number of structures in the perimeter, et cetera. Um, it's a fine line to walk, um, and we've we've kind of been really quiet about this. We don't put forecasts out on Twitter. We don't try to get media coverage, although. Uh, there's a news station in the Bay Area that uses Pyrocast sometimes on their, on the, on their evening news because, I, I mean, this is a real concern. What if the model's wrong? What if somebody makes a decision because the model's wrong um, or, 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 you know, makes a decision and the model turns out to be, be wrong? So, um, you know, I could, I could argue either side of this debate, but my sense from working with this for a few years is that Although the tool might not get every last detail right, it's going to tell you roughly the direction the fire is going to go and give an idea if it's going to spread quickly or not. Um, and it might not get every, every detail right, but frankly, that's better than nothing in a lot of cases. So um, the way that I envision this eventually getting to is the way hurricane forecasting is done. Right? Meteorologists don't go and run weather models. They interpret output from weather models um, and those models are pretty darn accurate. Our models are not at that point yet, um, but after additional development and, and testing, they may eventually get there uh, due to all these Im- improvements. Um, and I think when that happens, then we have a, a pretty, um, pretty cool system for disseminating information to the public. But right now, it's really, I don't think it's quite there yet. I don't know much about level set methods and methods, but from what you presented, does the fire that you model doesn't have any depth, right? It's just a moving line for the landscape or whatever. Um, so we use what's called the narrow band level set method, which basically, if, if you think about tracking the fire front, if you've got a big old computational domain, say 30 kilometers by 30 kilometers, you don't need to solve those equations in every single grid cell. You just need to solve them in enough of a band around the fire front that you can calculate those gradients, right? You need like three cells on each side. So um, we only solve those equations in a very narrow band around the fire front. That's why it's able to, um, you know, it's one of the reasons that it's so scalable and runs so, so quickly is it's a sparse matrix, essentially. But yeah, the, the, the um, level set method only is applied in a you know, very narrow buffer essentially surrounding where the fire front is. Oh, I was just going to add Charlotte. Check out wildfirerisk.org. Okay. It's a website that the Forest Service has that's like meant to communicate these ideas to the public about how to keep the house burning down if yeah. there are risks. And stuff. But it doesn't get into nearly any depth that Chris's stuff does. But. Yeah, and wildfirerisk.org was developed with with FSIM using the fire currents database and and so on. So it's like um, a like a backward looking, you know, based on historical data kind of an analysis. Um, we like we have done that um, type of analysis also with uh, with Elm Fire, um, but really the emphasis for this project is on forecasting. Like, can can we forecast short term? Risk because I think we have a decent handle on long term risk, frankly. Uh, Short term risk in some cases, not so much. Yeah, the, the other one's not just as like a, just a general information of like maybe you should be thinking about fire or you're all right, I can't forecast it. That's the last question on the day. Amazing work. Uh, like you mentioned that like you do not include suppression in this, and do you have that in, as an objective of this project? Like, and Okay, so we actually have, we do have a suppression model, we just don't use it that often. Um, so you may see, if you come back here later this summer, you may see for two fires, one would be called like New Mexico Pass, like the, the Pass Fire in New Mexico, and then there would be called New Mexico Pass Suppressed. 
Um, and the reason we're running that is to, you know, compare how, how the, the model, um, how, you know, how suppression affects the model results. So the way the current algorithm works is it identifies the slowest spreading parts of the fire front, estimates a, con a change in containment from yesterday to today, and then knocks down, basically marks as non-burnable, the slowest uh, spreading parts of the, of the fire front. Um, we have a collaboration with a, a company that's heavy into AI that is, they're, they're actually, um, what do they call it? They're actually transcoding Elmfire. So Elmfire is written in Fortran, believe it or not. Uh, they're transcoding Elmfire into Python because all AI is done in Python. <laughs> So there's going to actually be a Python version of Elmfire, and then they're, um, they've developed an agent-based um, suppression model, and they're going to basically train that model against fires using the Python version of Elmfire and their agent-based suppression model. So there's a couple, I don't know how well it'll work, maybe it'll work great, maybe it won't, I don't, I don't know. I mean, AI is pretty amazing. Um, so. So that, those are kind of the two classes, the two categories of suppression models. One is like real, real simple, like just, you know, it's mimicking how fires are actually suppressed. You don't suppress the head fire because you can't. Um, you suppress the heel and the flanks and then build a box around it. Um, and so that's, that's, you know, kind of the way the suppression models are, are, um, are laid out currently. All right. So we're running out of time. Let's thank your Chris.